Thanks. Thanks, Eric. Uh, before you leave, I just want to say a big thank you to Eric uh, for all the organization, getting us set up. I think we know what we're going to do for one hour and 30 minutes. So thanks, Eric. And thanks to Berkeley as well for organizing the workshop. Um, I personally really enjoyed it. Um, so the, we are in panel number eight, okay? And the goal is to speak about uh, math and data science and mostly about education. So uh, if you're in a math department or I would assume maybe a statistic department or a, maybe a math and statistic department, um, how do you change your curriculum? How do you revise your classes? Or what are you doing now as far as data science? Um, I just wanted to introduce with a story from CU Denver. I am the chair of the department and I'm really focused on our alumni, trying to know what our, our alumni are doing. I'm following them on LinkedIn and uh, they're all data scientists, all of them. So, I mean, I think we need to do something about that. And so I'm very excited to learn about this panel. Uh, we have four uh, pretty well-known people. So, um, and I'm going to try to do my best to say the name correctly. So Johanna Hardin, David Austin, Tim Chartier, and Girija Ranade. Um, and, um, and so I, uh, I want to first explain uh, the framework of uh, our time frame. Um, so I'm going to start speaking a little bit like that, introducing the, the speaker. Uh, then everybody will speak for 10, 15 minutes about and uh, you, the audience, uh, please uh, post question in the q and I'll try to monitor the chat as well, but for question, please go in the Q&A and I will log the question and try to ask your question um, to the panelists, right? Um, uh, so we have about an hour of, oh, okay, let's say 40 minutes. So we'll have about 40 minutes of presentation and then 30 minutes where we hope that it will be more interactive and the five of us will discuss but it just it's not at all about the five of us it's about you the audience so please ask the question you're curious about and we'll be more than happy to really relay, relay them to the to the speakers um so i am not sure of the order so i think the order just for the speakers is going to be tim dave joe and dirija okay that's the order that we decided, so that's great. Uh, so Tim Chartier is professor of mathematics at Davidson's College. Uh, Davidson's College is in North Carolina. Um, Tim got his PhD from Colorado Boulder, so not too far <laughs> from where I am now. Hi, Tim. <laughs> and um, Tim specializes in sports analytics, so where there is lots of data, and he consults with ESPN, The New York Times, U.S. Olympic and Para-Olympic committees and team in the NBA, NFL, and NASCAR. Uh, he oversees close to 100 student researchers who supplies analytics to Davidson College sports teams, which include basketball, football, soccer, volleyball, baseball, and swimming. Tim has also worked with Google and Pixar on their educational initiatives. So I think I'm going to let, uh, from there on, I'm going to let Tim speak for 10, 15 minutes, and then we'll, uh, we'll go down the list of people. Uh, one of my job is to ask questions. Another thing is that I need to be time management, so I will make sure to maybe stop with that. Tim, you may go. Great, thank you, Julian, and thank you for keeping track of time. I'm at home, um, half my family's gone, and the one family member who is here is the worst at using the broadband at home. So I might be a little jittery at times, but that's just part of the remote world. So. Here we go. I've decided that the way that I'm going to talk about the curriculum is in particular how you add content that into particular classes. So um, I hope that's visible. I'm not used to hopping, but it looks like uh, it should be. It's great. So, great. Thank you. So how do we add math and data together within the mathematical curriculum? I'm going to talk about it both in and out of class, and there are freedoms that you have when things are not in class, and I do believe that students can learn a lot out of class. So while it's not the formal curriculum, I do see it as connected. So let's start within class. So in particular, one of the things that students can do is learn that with data, you can at least make better predictions. You may not predict things, but you can better predict things. And one of the ways that I do that, given my work in sports, not everything in this talk will be sports, but one of the big ways I do it is actually through bracketology with March Madness. March Madness is a very large and pop topic within the United States in March. 
the men and women both enter their individual tournament with uh, 68 teams, or but it's really 64 when you have to begin to predict. And there are mathematical algorithms that are ranking algorithms that can be applied to the tournament. So I've actually worked with middle school through college students and also just the general public on that particular idea. And often when people look at how their brackets do, they're using mathematical thinking to think about the types of ways that they model the tournament. So there's the algorithm development, which involves computer coding, as you see here. The ice cream cone is actually that we actually have an in-class tournament to see how we do in the local Ben and Jerry's offers free ice cream for the winner. And Kelly here was actually not a basketball fan. And generally one of the good lessons to learn is that usually heavy basketball fans actually don't do well because they try to overfit the data to their opinion, which is usually not a good idea. So to give you a sense of the methods, in 2009, it was a research topic. The way that we do it comes out of my research with Amy Langville of the College of Charleston. And our best bracket beat 97% of the 4 million brackets. The next year it was a homework assignment. This was before Kelly. And the best student's bracket was in the 99.9%. So the site is marchmathness.davidson.edu. It doesn't always perform that well. We've added a lot of features, which means people can really create poor brackets if they work at it. But nonetheless, it's been covered in various media, as you see on the slide. Another place is to move outside of sports, not that you can't do data for good within sports, but we also move outside of sports as well. So within classes, one of the places is to do data visualization, which is a good place for data exploration with community partners. So here are three examples of ones used by students taking a general ed course. It's called finite math. It's the last math class many of them will take. It's the, you know, they wish many of them when they walk in that they weren't even taking the math class, which is one of the reasons I wanted to teach skills that they can use beyond that. And also why I think data fluency is important as a mathematical skill. The book does talk about data visualization and data communication. And so this particular infographic was created in connection with our local farm at the college in talking about ways that the farm is used within uh, the college in a variety of ways. This was with the local habitat, and this was also having to do with food at the college. And I've been doing these for quite a few years, so much so that I don't have community partners right now because for I've had 21 projects a year for 10 years. And so for right now, I have to come up with the infographics for a few years to let them begin to refill. This year, I also worked with uh, Dr. Joseph Awudzi, who is a sociologist at Davidson College, and he uses qualitative methods in particular to look at marginalized populations in urban locales and make sense of the inequalities in their lives. One of the projects we did, we did a, a several, this is with math majors at a junior senior level course, is that they looked at a local road that goes from, so this is Charlotte, North Carolina, and it goes, it, as you drive along the road, you begin to see uh, inequities dealing with the, as you move north, it goes from um, in the south here, it often is, these are using clustering, K means clustered together, often with um, less desirable attributes of education, income, health, and so forth that we looked at. But you see this little part down here, and that has to do with gentrification, is that you begin to see it very clearly with that. And so the students not only did the data, they also made conclusions, but more importantly, we will work with uh, Dr. Ed Woozy's students this summer in his REU to continue that work. So it's kind of where we uh, pass it to, uh, to each other. So outside the classroom, the main place that I do this is within my CAT stats program. We aren't doing veterinarian work. We're doing uh, sports work because we are the Davidson Wildcats. And so that's why we do that. And I have a group of students. If it's 100 students recently, <laughs> we started with three uh, in 2013 and we're now at 100. We do a variety of sports as mentioned in the introduction. Here, students are getting ready to record data at a basketball game. From our success locally working with coaches, we've worked with the Hornets in NASCAR, in minor league baseball, within the NFL in the draft, and the NBA league office in officiating analytics. 
From there, we've also done projects with local or national media. We've been in ESPN Magazine, and then students have published in Nylon Calculus, which works on writing. And then we also offered analytics to CBS uh, during March Madness and Fox Sports during the uh, Women's FIFA World Cup. The nice thing about all that work is it allows students to move into internships, as you see here. They can intern with a variety of sports groups working with data, but then they can also get jobs in sports, as you see with the Jets, the Bulls, and the Braves, but also in data companies. Red Ventures is a massive marketing firm in just at the border of North and South Carolina. Traceda is a data firm in Charlotte, which is again where I'm close to. And then we've had students go to Microsoft, Google, and Amazon out of the CAT Stats group as well. In terms of research, very quickly, we continue to work at Bracketology, which deals with ranking. We have the work with the US Olympic Committee. We just finished a project on finding future talent, which is actually all I'm able to say. You can ask, why didn't I use the logo? It's the one thing about the agreement is I can't use the logo. That's one of their biggest things that they're resistant to people using. And then we do a variety of projects with media. We're working on one uh, recently with an NBA podcast. All of that to say that math and data can have an impact both in and outside the classroom. So why do data in and out of the classroom? One of the main things is that I think it builds a data mindset. How do you approach data? What kind of questions can you have? have? What types of tools will you have? And as was alluded in the introduction to this entire session, what math do you need in order to learn? But the other big attribute for me is it helps students have the courage to take their own thoughts seriously, which is an Einstein quote. One of the big attributes of the work that we do is that almost all the time when we're asked to do questions, particularly from national media, we don't know how to do it. And having students get used to, I know I have my tools and I will begin to explore and being comfortable with that unknown is also, in my opinion, part of the data mindset and part of the mindset that they'll need, even if they're only marginally involved with data in the future. So those are the ways that I come at having math and data in education. Thanks, Tim. That was great. Uh, yeah, we clap, so I'm going to make noise me. Okay, good <laughs> Thank you. That was great. It's very exciting to, I mean, I'm sure it's exciting for the student to work with uh, sport analytics and all that. It's always, it's always, it's an easy one, but getting good results is probably hard. So that's another one. Um, so we got one question in the chat. I have a few questions myself, but we are going uh, to move on right away to Dave Austin. Uh, so Dave Austin is a professor at Grand Valley State University. So this is a university in Michigan. And um, I personally know the work of Dave Austin because he did a wonderful uh, OER, Open Education Resource book on linear algebra. Uh, it's a very good book, so I encourage everybody to, uh, to check out the book. Um, and so um, he has been involved uh, in, the develop, uh, in the curriculum development at his department. Um, and guess what? On linear algebra in particular. Um, he also leads a mathematics capstone course in which he work in teams on semester-long data science project paired with a community partner. So, Dave, uh, the platform is yours. Great. Thank you so much. I'm so happy to be here today with uh, everyone and all these panelists. Um, I'm going to try to share my screen here. So let's see how this goes. Does that look okay to everybody? Let's see, I'm not hearing, I'm not hearing any. Yeah, we see it, great, okay. it looks great. Okay, great, thank you. Um, so yeah, so this session is called Math for Data Science, um, but I teach in a math department. So in some sense, I invert this a little bit and think about data science for math, and because I, I think there's some really great opportunities for that partnership. So what I'd like to do is uh, share with you how we've uh, brought ideas from data science into our mathematics curriculum and some of the impact that that's had. Um, first off, let me let me say just a little bit about where I am. So I'm at a university in West Michigan. We have about 21,000 students or so. Um, we have some professional master's programs, but by and large, our main mission is undergraduate education. Um, about 38% of our students are first generation uh, students. They're, you know, large, large percentage uh, from West Michigan. 
We have a data science minor that's taught in the departments of, of uh, computer science and statistics, and it doesn't have any mathematics requirements other than the, um, you know, other than maybe some prerequisites for the courses there. And there's a similar master's in data science course as well. So we've we've made some changes to our curriculum lately to to um, bring on an applied math emphasis within the last couple of years, and the focus in that has really been preparing students for eventual careers using their mathematical training. And you know when you talk to students and ask them what they're doing, by and large, uh, the overwhelming majority of our students are doing something with data and has been brought up on a number of panels and sessions that I've seen here uh, this week. Very few students are actually using calculus, but uh, they're much more engaged with ideas that touch on um, linear algebra instead. So we took the perspective that we, we really wanted to emphasize linear algebra. And in the same way, we know a lot of our students are involved in computation some way, so we wanted to develop their, uh, their computational proficiency in ways that we weren't doing previously. So for our um, courses in linear algebra, we have a two course linear algebra sequence um, that's required of all our applied and theoretical math majors. And I think what's noteworthy here is that calculus is not a prerequisite for these courses. So we get freshmen coming in uh, the first semester uh, that they're at, at that they're at university, and an increasing number of them are opting for the linear algebra sequence. Um, maybe uh, not even taking the calculus sequence, or maybe taking it at the at the same time. Um, we've also done outreach to local high schools uh, to let them know about about this uh, these courses, and uh, to inform their students about them. So we're, we're getting high school students uh, that are dual enrolled in these courses as well. And they really seem to be thriving and, and loving the courses. So, um, and this, this really touches on the session yesterday morning about adoption of data science in high school. So what we're really trying to do is, is to provide a second pathway into university level mathematics. And in particular, I think, I think Taylor Gibson in that panel uh, said he, he viewed data science as a reset button uh, that we're all, um, you know, the, the mathematics curriculum is geared so relentlessly towards calculus that data science can really uh, provide an alternative for that with really pretty profound implications for equity as well. So this was, this was really another, um, another motivation for these changes. So when people in that session yesterday were saying we need university people on board, I was jumping up and down and waving my arms, but, you know, then my camera wasn't on. These courses really have three primary legs to the stool, I guess you could say. Um, they're in no way uh, you know, a mathematics proof-based course, but the students are engaged in mathematical reasoning and thinking conceptually about linear algebra. Um, I, think, I think linear algebra, as much as any area of mathematics, has shaped the way our society looks these days. So we wanted to really introduce meaningful applications to uh, anchor the conceptual thinking that the students are doing as well. And we wanted the students to be uh, interacting with these ideas by, uh, by, by, uh, through meaningful computation as well. So just to give you a sense of what these courses look like, the first course, it's kind of a standard course, I would say. There's stuff about bases, um, transformations, and eigen thingies. Um, they look at the JPEG compression algorithm as an example of change of basis. They look at Markov chains and Google's PageRank algorithm. And we, the primary computation that they do in this course is in Sage, which is based on Python. So they're getting kind of a gentle introduction to Python without really knowing that they are. And um, the, the syntax of Sage uh, mirrors mathematical notation. And it's super easy for the students to access. They can just go to a web page and they have cells there they're able to work in pretty easily. And this has actually been you know, really successful at getting students involved in some uh, simple computation in this course. The second course has quite a bit more uh, ideas from data science. So 
we you know we do things like least squares, the spectral theorem, and uh, quadratic forms, singular value decompositions, and one of the things I think has been really successful is to use this idea of uh, is is to use um, the idea of variance as a motivating idea. So in the past, um, students have never really understood what a quadratic form is, but having this example of a variance to kind of tack on to this you know, more abstract idea, it's like, okay, yeah, this, this seems pretty straightforward. We do things in this course like um, k-means clustering. We do a variety of regression models. We do principal component analysis. Um, we look at applications of the singular value decomposition to uh, we look at voting patterns on the Supreme Court, and we look at uh, we build a recommender system as well. So the students are are getting are kind of getting their hands and working working with data in a fairly significant sort of way. Uh, we start moving the students into a collab environment, which they really love because it's got a kind of a Google Docs feel that they're familiar with. Um, I know enough that I shouldn't say realistic, clean, and data in the same sentence, but, you know, we present them with clean data, but the uh, data that comes from realistic sources. And um, just the way that the Data8 has a Python module that goes with the course, we have a Python module here that enables students to write collab uh, code uh, using Sage-like syntax, and eventually they start moving over to something like NumPy. There's a textbook uh, that I wrote, Understanding Linear Algebra, that supports uh, these courses. It's got embedded Sage cells in it, and you can load things like Pandas and Seaborn in, into the book and uh, create some visualizations. And, you know, what's really cool to me, we used to offer this course once every other year before we did this redesign, and now we're offering multiple sections of it every year. Um, we've got students from math, from CS, um, stats. We've got students from economics, psychology, and sociology. And the kind of collaborations you get when students are working in class is just really cool to see. Um, in our later classes, there's a math modeling class and numerical analysis that students are, again, uh, getting into collab a little more significantly. They're writing uh, co code in NumPy and that ecosystem. They're doing some data cleaning in the modeling class. Um, in numerical analysis, they implement gradient descent to train a logistic regression model, and they actually implement backpropagation to train a neural net to recognize handwritten digits. And after they do all that, we say, Haha, there's actually standard libraries that do all this in a couple of lines of code. But the students are appreciative of having that, that um, the coding experience, they feel like they've learned something from the coding experience. They feel like they know what goes into these libraries and choices that are being made for them and how they might need to tweak them at times. I haven't said anything about stats. Uh, so I'm teaching this in a mathematics program. There is a separate stats uh, department and we encourage our students to take a lot more stats we have a lot of um, stats minors you know, or maybe uh, students that are double majors with stats. And then some of the students are taking uh, you know, some of the graduate level machine learning courses as well. And the final, the final course is uh, an experiential based um, course where students are working in teams with a, with a, a community partner on a semester long project I didn't initially set this up to be a data science course, but it's kind of turned into that because there's so many great um, data science projects in the community. The students, you know, they're, they're working here with realistic data. They've got to do a lot of cleaning. They do visualization. I think most importantly, they've, they've got to communicate their findings to a non-technical audience in a way that gives them confidence in those findings. And they really see the data as about people. So they, you know, we don't have a formal ethics component to the program, but, you know, we have a lot of those conversations about making sure that important voices are being heard when we're using data. Just as some, as some examples, uh, we've partnered with the city of Grand Rapids to, uh, uh, to, to develop uh, ways of, of, of targeting housing assistance with greater uh, greater access and equity 
Uh, the students have advised the city on uh, dispersing a federal grant to provide assistance with lead abatement in historically disadvantaged neighborhoods. They've also worked with a group of emergency care doctors and staffing emergency rooms and also understanding patients or factors that drive patient satisfaction. So, you know, one question that I think is important is asking what's the value of the math in this story? Um, so, you know, if students are going to do data science, why do they need to know this math? Because uh, you can implement so much of this so easily with a few lines of code. And I think I really saw this with the patient satisfaction project in particular. Um, the students reported that having the math training really helped them uh, to create a lot of different models and assess what the models were doing and to really understand the structure of the data better than they would otherwise. So I'm going to leave it there. Thank you very much. Uh, and I'd be happy to respond to questions in the Q&A. Um, and I've got an issue here that I think I can't, um, yeah, I think I can't get rid of my screen sharing without leaving the session and coming back. So I'm going to do that. And I hope this wasn't, you know, at some terrible level, so you won't let me back in. I think but, it's fine, Dave. Um, okay. Let's wait. That I think Joe is next, and when Joe's pop is going to screen share, I think she's going to take the screen from you. Maybe okay. so. Maybe that'll help. I had the same problem uh, on Wednesday. So. Okay. Great. Great. Thank okay. You. Great. That. Okay. Joe Perfect. Thank you. Um, Yay! All right. So now I'm going to go full screen, which means I'm not going to be able to see anything or any of you. Uh, but uh, just use your words if uh, if I need to speak up or clarify anything. Um, thank you for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, my name is Joe Harden, and I teach in a department of mathematics and statistics. And for the first two decades I was there, it was the Department of Mathematics. So we just now changed uh, the name of the department. So I live in a, in a mathematics world, um, but I'm a statistician. And I've, I've taught some calculus along the way, but I, uh, I, my, my bread and butter is statistics. And I really value everything that um, that the previous speakers have have spoken to in terms of bringing data in and using computational methods and uh, all those applications. But that's not what I'm going to talk about today. Um, today, I'm going to talk about uh, the, the math pieces um, uh, and, and how we can incorporate really those math parts into data science. OK, so um, so, you know, the the key that the 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 take i'm the place i'm coming from here is that i really want students to understand that behind everything we're doing there's some mathematics and um you know whether that's one of these predictive algorithms or even whether it's the data viz right you're you're making a box plot you're finding quartiles. You're making a density plot, which is a smoothed histogram. You know, you're you're smoothing it via a mathematical procedure. Uh, and so, the idea of doing data science, you know, without mathematics, it just doesn't exist. So, understanding we all come from different levels of mathematics, but that we're all using mathematics, I think, is so 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 important for our data science students. In the last five years or so, there's been a slew of um, recommendations and guidelines uh, associated with STAT programs, STAT curricula, data science programs, and whatnot. And, and 201, they all agree that there should be an integration between the mathematical things we're doing, the computational things we're doing, and the data science things we're doing. They say things like, you know, math majors, math programs should include computing and modeling and data. Um, you know, that we should teach technology as a tool for solving problems and as an aid to exploring mathematical ideas. But then the flip side is, okay, well, if you're really doing data science, what is the importance of having math? Um, and, and again, you know, I've already sort of said this, that mathematics is the language of all of the models. Everything we're doing relies on mathematics. Um, and so a working data science, data scientist, should require a firm foundation. But then we get to what does that mean? It means maybe six classes, right? 
so you know some some calculus some linear algebra some discrete math and some probability theory which understandably is completely implausible right you can't have a data science major with six mathematics classes a little bit of cs some statistics here and there you're you don't have anything left right and and all the other things we've been talking about with respect to um you know the panel yesterday who who the reset on data science so who gets into these advanced classes who's doing the data science it just doesn't make any sense and and we shouldn't think that we have to stick with the current curriculum and use every single topic in each one of these six courses in order to get that understanding that mathematics is grounding data science we can do it in fewer than six courses so I'm going to use support vector machines here as a little case study. And support vector machines is a pretty mathematical topic. We've got this idea of transforming a, a really high dimensional space, possibly even an infinite dimensional space. And in that very high dimensional space, we, um, we put a, a, a plane, a linear hyperplane, and, uh, and then we uh, minimize the expression that I've boxed on the slide. And so we've got ideas of transformations, minima, dot products. We've got this thing called the kernel, kernel rule um, or kernel trick. We've got linear algebra. We've got Lagrange multipliers. So in order to, to minimize this equation, we're going to use Lagrange multipliers. So I might argue that even your math majors, even your pure math majors, are not seeing Lagrange multipliers in their undergraduate curriculum. But that, you know, the gist of this uh, method can be understood if one understands how to optimize a function. So if we're using calculus as a tool for teaching what it means to have the minimum of a function or the maximum of a function or a local min, a local max, we can break down a support vector machine into a, a really sort of, um, you know, a picturesque, as I have here, uh, idea that boils down to an optimization problem. And we, we get the students away from thinking, oh, support vector machines, it's some kind of magical thing that happens and we get a prediction of, you know, a yes, no support vector machines are typically a binary prediction. No, we're, we're actually doing some sort of mathematics. Uh, and, and they can understand that, I believe, with, uh, with just the understanding that comes from sort of optimizing much simpler functions. Similarly, I think that understanding numerical approximations right? Numerical approximations to functions, numerical approximations to areas, numerical approximations to finding real roots or solving equations. I think that those topics uh, that come, you know, from, from Calc 1 or Calc 2 um, are really valuable for thinking about higher order machine learning, higher order data science, how are functions being approximated? How are we applying um, models in, in various cases? Um, I think that those are really a lot more important than, for example, even knowing what the derivative of the sign is, right? Like my students who are required to know how to take derivatives of, of um, you know, trig functions, even though they're sort of, you know, required to know this, they're using Wolfram Alpha to do everything. Right, so, so we have all these tools and we were talking about, you know, using the computer, but really this sort of root ground understanding, I think will help our students understand what's going on um, in those machine learning algorithms as they become data scientists. So why do we need to understand mathematics? So we might be building models, tuning, per, uh, tuning parameters or penalizing models. Um, this second one about communicating, you know, you might run a logistic regression and a logistic regression um, is, a, is a model that sort of uh, uses binary response variable, yes, no response variable um, as, a, as a function of, um, uh, as a linear function of a bunch of explanatory variables. So the output of a linear, uh, the output of a logistic regression might be that linear piece of the um, 
explanatory variables, and we could call that the log odds. Or we might have e to the linear piece, and we would call that the odds. Or for the output of a logistic regression, we might want the success, the probability of success rather. And so then that's e to the linear over one plus e to the linear. Or instead of having the probability of success, we might want to know a, a classification, right? Did, did you classify it as true or did you classify it as false? And, and any of those four objects where some are these continuous values, some are continuous set on zero one, some are class membership, those are all super legitimate outputs from a logistic regression uh, and different software is going to out output different, different ones. So again, you know, understanding, okay, what is this model, just even from a functional form? And, and producing reproducible, producing reproducible analyses with the idea of, okay, this is a model and I'm running these steps and I should get the same thing every time. Or if I don't get the same thing, where does the variability come in? Right? If I'm numerically approximating, maybe I've I've done some kind of random selection of points on a square to get the approximate density or something like that right so kind of understanding can i work through all of these steps and get the same answer back or is there some stochasticity to to what i'm doing okay so sorry um so one last thing to consider before i i kind of uh speak to what a possible curriculum could be is who is this curriculum for right so i'm talking about the math classes, the math topics that are being taught for people who are interested in data science. And I would argue that there's three possible audiences. So the first audience is us. And, and I would maybe say, this is not the audience I'm talking about. So the us are the people who are going to then go on to get PhDs or master's degrees, higher level work, and they're going to be developing algorithms and they're going to be, you know, pushing the boundaries. And that's not really pushing the boundaries of data science. That's not really who I'm talking about, right? I'm thinking about sort of, okay, what sort of mathematics can we get to these students to get them up and running in data science? So then there's a second group who I'm not talking about. I'm not talking about the consumers. I believe that we should do data science for all. I think that the work that's being done in K-12 right now is absolutely fantastic and teaching, you know, an understanding of, of um, you know, how data science affects us every single day um, is so important for, for people to understand. But that's not what I'm talking about right now. What I'm talking about are the people who are going to be data scientists. And, you know, I just uh, took this off the web. So, you know, they've got an analytics engineer, a data scientist, a data engineer. And, and these people work with the models at a high enough level that they really should have some sense of either what, what the mathematics behind the model is or um, that there is mathematics behind that model and just kind of being able to think fluently if not, if not deeply about that specific um, mathematical technique. So here is a provocative suggestion. Uh, and this is oh, uh, just a AMS paper or uh, editorial that I wrote with Nick Horton, um, that we could teach these two classes, a discrete math class and a continuous math class with the, the topics as, as um, given here. And we could really just kind of revamp everything and think about what are the topics. Um, you know, we were just talking about linear algebra a little bit, and I totally agree that linear algebra for a data scientist, it's, it's pretty important for them to understand, uh, you know, when a matrix is, um, is not full rank, right? But maybe it's not so important that they know that there's seven different ways to measure that and be able to prove that all seven of those, you know, different techniques for, for um, finding uh, if a matrix is full rank, that, that those are equivalent, right? Instead, it's much more important to be able to, you know, work with matrices and, and do projections, let's say, or transformations and kind of thinking about what a matrix really is. 
Um, similarly, I think I read in the chat about higher order calculus that that the calculus that we're applying is higher order. But I would I would challenge us to think about the calculus that's taught, you know, that Calc one and Calc two courses, and really kind of what are the most important issue, what are the most important topics in those classes, and can we teach them in such a way that when I show you the higher order, the higher level calculus, you say, oh yeah, 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 that's just an extension. I don't really understand the extension, but I can see that it's an extension. So, so that's what I would challenge us to do is take those first classes um, and see if we can extend them. So, um, you know, one of the keys to this, and we've seen this a little bit in the previous two talks is, you know, to find that good machine learning problem and, and to back out the math. So thinking about model optimization to teach ideas of minimum maxima, using linear models to teach linear algebra, uh, confounding and causal models to teach graph theory, and interaction to teach ideas of partial derivatives. So I'm not the first person to have, you know, thought about the, the topics, the, the undergraduate math curriculum and how that might um, intersect with, um, with data science, but, um, but it is a hard, question. It's a hard question because developing such a curriculum is is difficult um, cognitively, right? How do these things fit together? How do they, um, how do they, uh, uh, you know, what do we take out? What do we leave in? What's most important? Um, but also how do we, uh, you know, take a mathematics curriculum that exists at our institution and how do we me mess that up, right? How do we, uh, you know, keep students on track if they want to be math majors, but then not require everybody if they don't want to be math majors. There's a lot of things to consider. Um, but I just want to point out that there are people who are doing this. So this is a book, Mathematics for Machine Learning. It does assume the reader to have, um, you know, some, some uh, sort of Calc 1, um, maybe Calc 1 plus background um but that they're they're really trying to say okay these are the topics and this is sort of an ordering that would really set someone up nicely for being able to be successful in data science and in machine learning so this is the table of contents for the text and you can see it's it's already some of the things that i've discussed and the previous speakers have discussed that that we're really kind of highlighting linear algebra and and some calculus and probability um, but the, that we're doing it in such a way that we're really focusing on the the aspects of those mathematical topics that are important for machine learning uh, and then and then the part two where um where the models are sort of at the at the forefront, whereas part one, it's like the mathematics is at the forefront. And I think that is all I have. Thank you all for being here. Thanks, Joe. Thanks a lot. Um, and yeah, I just wanted to say that Joe is uh, from uh, Pomona College in uh, California, and she has worked a lot on uh, curriculum, as you could have understood from her talks. And so in particular, she has been uh, involved in the 2014 uh, ASA curriculum, so the curriculum for undergraduate statistics and the connection with data science. So uh, I wanted to say that. Um, and so the, the uh, and thanks for everybody for being on time. I just want to remind everybody that there is a Q&A going on, okay? So if you're lost, uh, go on the Q&A, you can ask your question and we will go over uh, some of these questions. And the question also have a feature to vote, so you can upvote a question. And so if you are, if somebody already asked a question that you wanted to ask, they just put a thumbs up and the questions goes up in the list, okay? Um, so the next speaker is uh, Jirija Ranade and uh, she's an assistant teaching professor at UC Berkeley. And before joining the faculty at UC Berkeley, Dr. Ranade was a researcher at Microsoft Research AI in the Adaptive System and Interaction Group. She also designed and taught the first offering for the new course sequence in the EECS department at UC Berkeley. And uh, she has received the 2017 UC Berkeley Electrical and Engineering Award for Outstanding Teaching. And this one is awesome. And congratulations, Dr. Ranade, for the 2020 UC Berkeley Award for Extraordinary Teaching in Extraordinary Times. That's wonderful. Um, so Dr. Uh, Jirija Ranade, please, uh, the floor is yours. 
Thank you very much. Uh, let's see if this works. Can you see my screen? So far, we cannot. Oh, dear. Oh. Uh, Something, yep. So we good? We see. Yeah. And perfect. You can see this? OK, great. So I cannot see you or the chat. So if right. I need to be interrupted, please do interrupt me. Um, so yeah, thanks everyone for the invitation to, to be here and um, it's a hard act to follow after all of these um, uh, really interesting talks and you know it's kind of exactly on point, this is exactly the topic that I also want to talk about and I'm going to be talking about also the redesign of our curriculum that we've done to try and introduce linear algebra to our students in the very first year with very little prerequisites. So, um, you know, I, I feel like I'm already preaching to the choir here. Everyone's already converted on how important linear algebra uh, is. But I'll jump in with some questions that I often pose to our students in the early days of the class. Probably all of you already know the answers. Um, but, you know, what's the idea that makes Shazam work and idea that makes the GPS on your phone work. This is math educators, so everyone probably knows. Um, I'll just go to the answer, which is cross correlation or dot product, right? Um, Shazam, by the way, for people who might not have used the app, is an app where you can just to record a little snippet of a song, and it'll tell you what the song is just by you know essentially running a, a cross correlation. So, for a lot of students, this is like whoa, and we try to teach them how this works. By the by the end of the course um, or um, you know did you know that the same idea that allows Netflix to give you recommendations um, that helps us also uncover voting patterns of politicians I know someone uh, mentioned also like voting patterns on the Supreme Court I think a similar idea could be used also helps us build better cameras and better software for cameras well what's this idea and how could we teach it to students in their very first year. Um, well, this is singular value decomposition. And again, um, something that we try to tie together for students uh, in the very first year in, in this course. A last idea, I'll go through it quickly, you know, touch screens, autonomous cars, search engines, um, neural networks. Well, this is all eigen stuff, right? As the new term that we've been, uh, we've been talking about. Eigen stuff, stability, feedback, these are all connected. And um, what we try to do is we try to expose students to these ideas that math isn't just some abstract equation, but is connected to all of these things that they tangibly can think about and interact with and try to show them through homework problems exactly how they can do all of these things uh, using the mathematical concepts we're teaching them. So. Um, this course sequence that I want to talk about is a two semester course sequence. It's called EECS 16A and 16B, and we teach it in the electrical engineering and computer science department, but a lot of data science students in our uh, curriculum also end up taking this course. And we're really trying to get to kind of modeling and problem formulation as well as design thinking and showing the interconnections across the department. So we want to bring in this linear algebraic perspective as you know, the key mathematical tool that lets them get to systems, circuit design, control, and machine learning. And because we're an engineering department, we also bring in these ideas from engineering and have kind of hands-on labs that the students do to kind of get a tangible um, feel on the uh, abstract linear algebraic concepts. So, you know, we are really, again, kind of uh, talking about this idea that learning optimization linear algebra is very fundamental to um, modern day engineering or computer science, in some cases, even more important than calculus, as we've been discussing. And what we try to really show them is this full pipeline of how a data scientist might think is that first you have to collect data from the real world. Then you make a model about it and you process it. And then you close the loop by taking that, you know, information and taking an action in the real world. And we try and show them this whole kind of full loop in a way that's complementary, 
to the introductory computer science course that often many students are taking and showcasing basically the diversity of things that one can do with a data science or a computer science education that goes beyond programming because programming gets a lot of attention in the popular media but these mathematical topics don't necessarily so just to give you a sense of what we think about in the class we have two semesters so our first semester is basically divided into three modules it's an introduction to systems and so here our key application that we talk about is tomography and we try to teach them how an imaging system will work from scratch. And in the lab, they actually build their own single pixel camera. I'll show you a picture later if I have time. But we use this to introduce the idea of not just matrices, but also inverse problems. And then we talk about, you know, well, this is how to build a model, but how do you actually design something? And for this, the key lab that students work on is they build their own touch screen. So they actually have a capacitive touch screen where they touch a little sensor and they do a little bit of linear algebraic processing to be able to see, okay, well, can I detect this touch or not? Um, and this is connected to eigenvalues and feedback using the idea of operational amplifiers. And our final module, which students get the most excited about quite often, is the introduction to machine learning, where we teach them how to build their own acoustic GPS system from scratch. And you know, we build in the application of least squares, how to estimate, how to deal with noisy data. You have signals coming from multiple satellites. How am I supposed to understand exactly what my location is? What creates that blue dot on your phone? Um, and the exciting thing is that students get to build their own system. So they have a lot of kind of cool aha moments that they love in this last module. Then we move to the second semester, 16B, where um, here, we're really kind of going, really pushing on their calculus knowledge. They're taking this course in their first year, but we're assuming that they have had uh, a calculus prerequisite their first semester. So we're building out differential equations and you know, getting them to understand time constants and systems. And then use this to introduce them to kind of robotics and control and talk about these ideas of feedback, stability, so on and so forth. And finally, then getting into um, unsupervised machine learning. So in the first semester, they only see supervised machine learning applications. But then we come to basically the singular value decomposition and principal components analysis, as well as kind of ideas of linearization and classification, um, where we show them, again, without really using much probability, but just using the idea of SVD through uh, projections and uh, trying to understand that perspective to help them build their own basic classifiers. And they use this to build their final project in the class, which basically is um, a voice controlled uh, robotic car, which let's see if I have time to show you. Um, I see I don't have that much time, so I will skip this slide. But basically, the idea is that I'm trying to we're trying to showcase different connections to different areas and give people a sense of, oh, you know, there's not just, there's not a one size fits all thing here. You don't have to fit into a particular box to be able to, to be able to be a good computer scientist or a data scientist. But, you know, it's really a kind of make your own story situation, you know, here are all of the different cool things you can do and make your own road. You don't have to feel like you have to be a, of a certain type of person to succeed in this field. And we're really trying to present the mathematics in context. So for every single idea, abstract, um, you know, even as abstract as eigenvalues or inversion, Gaussian elimination, we try to have either a physical lab that they built or something like um, a homework problem that engages that mathematical concept and gets them to uh, see how something that they deal with, their, with in their real life depends on this mathematical concept. At the same time, we're trying to get them to understand how to, to prove some basic theorems, understand the fundamental principles, um, we don't want to compromise on the rigor that they would get from a, you know, a traditional theoretical linear algebra course 
And so there are a lot of proof type problems that we that we include in, in the in the course, but woven in through these applications. And our goal here really is to attract a very wide range of students, right? We don't want to have a limitation of students who are already committed to being engineers or computer scientists or data scientists, but we want to attract that student who didn't have an aunt or an uncle who was um, in a STEM field, had never heard of uh, you know, some of these subjects before. A lot of our students come in and they say, well, yeah, you're telling me to take optimization as a class, but what does optimization mean? What does signal processing mean? What does machine learning mean? And, you know, we talk about these things as those students understand them. For a lot of students, this is some bizarre jargon. And we want to say that, hey, actually, this isn't some bizarre jargon. This is actually something that you can understand tangibly. And here's this course that will give you a guide to what all of these words mean and show that they're actually accessible. They're within, you know, they're within your toolkit just in a couple of years. Um, so these abstract labs and Jupyter notebooks um, that we use, we hope are getting people to have a more concrete engagement with a lot of these uh, ideas. So I'll just show you, for example, this, um, picture of our, in, of, our, of our first lab, where they're basically, they're using this projector here to project light onto an image. This is a photodiode. And they basically project a pattern onto this image. So they use the basic idea of linearity, that if they illuminate some pixels and measure a linear combination of those pixels, and then they measure many linear combinations, an inversion will give them back the image. And they get to see that, you know, having multiple measurements can actually outperform a single measurement and see the power of, of modeling this very basic system in a very basic linear way. So this is the first setup that we try to get them um, to understand. And of course, you know, we talk about more complicated imaging systems like MRI and a more complex tomography that kind of gets a lot of students excited. Um, this is our first module, kind of our second module talks about um, touch screens. We use this to introduce a little bit of graphs. We talk about flows of charge and they also get to see kind of um, different perspectives on linear systems. So they see it through the perspective of superposition and they get to see how, you know, we think mathematically how things are equivalent, but they can now see, oh, this mathematical equivalence also corresponds to physical equivalence that I can build through circuits. So there's again a concreteness to the abstract mathematical concept that we try to uh, bring about for them. The final module is of course the GPS module as I, as I talked about, this is kind of the main introduction to, to machine learning. And then the second semester, uh, I'll be very short here. The main applications we talk about are again, like digital systems, we talk about um, brain machine interfaces as our main application for why to motivate uh, Fourier transforms and singular value decomposition because we then use this to do PCA and do spike sorting as is shown in the figure on the right. And this is the final project. Let me just try and see if you can see this. Um, what the student is doing is that they're using a voice command which is then classified using their hand-built uh, PCA algorithm and based on whether, which command is given, they, the student wants the car to either go in a circle or go straight. So let me play this, hopefully you can see it. Um, so I think I'm probably over time, so I will stop there. I'm happy to talk more and answer questions um, as needed. Um, yep, thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you, Rija. Yeah, it was wonderful. Um, this is really a wonderful presentation with starting with applications first and then showing the, all, all the mathematics behind. It's wonderful.
Um, I think we're, we're ready to start our Q&A. So we have about uh, 30 minutes. We have four wonderful panelists. So I'm trying to do my best to moderate this. I remind all the audience, you have the Q&A feature. Uh, and so you can ask questions, but you can also read questions of others and vote on, on, on the most uh, preferred question. I wanted to say one thing. Uh, David was presenting, and I want to tell you that in the chat, your eigen stuff was, uh, was a success. I would love the eigen stuff. So just, just letting you <laughs> okay so let's go with uh, a question that got 12 votes it's from alex dektiar so thanks alex for uh, asking the question and the question is basically um so there is we're speaking a lot about linear algebra and we're saying more and more that we need maybe a little bit less calculus no prerequisite for linear algebra so not the standard calculus prereq to go in linear algebra um, and so basically there is two kinds of math that is needed. Um, one is more for engineering where you have uh, kind of the linear algebra, but some calculus. And one that is more the standard engineering route where you have the standard Calc 1, Calc 2, Calc 3. Um, and the question is how, how do you reconcile that in a math and statistics department uh, when you have data science in mind? Um, so this is the question. Um, who wants to go first? Somebody has an idea. And I think it relates as well. I saw some question on what was your experience about changing those courses, how uh, bringing data science in your courses, how, how was this received, and um, kind of what is uh, what's the goal? Where are you going? Are you finished? Do you want to do more? And where are you now? Maybe we can all speak a little bit about this. Um, so who wants to start? Start. Joe, okay. So um, there was a question about at my school. My school, I, I, I mean, I'm, I've got a lot of really pure mathematicians in my department, so we're not really embarking on data science in any way, let alone redeveloping the math curriculum. So I haven't really been able to make headway uh, in my own department. But to this question, I think that, you know, it's baby steps. And so I, I put it back to the audience um, that what we need to do is create those, you know, like half an hour, just examples or assess uh, assignments or, you know, those really small little pieces and then publish them into education journals or write a blog about it and then tweet about it or whatever it is. But I think what needs to happen is that, you know, um, the go-to example uh, needs to be not velocity and acceleration. Right. So like every time you're teaching, you just you need the, 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 the I would say that the more we can blanket all of the math departments with these really cool kind of fun examples, the easier it will be then to, to transition into, um, uh, yeah, sort of a, a curriculum that's more um, connected to the data science ideas. So it's on you guys. Thank you. Somebody else to speak up about this issue? Dave? Yeah, yeah, I guess I would say, you know, where I am, changes have been extremely well received outside the math department, and especially by students as well. Students really like um, the, these new courses we have in linear algebra. And you hear things like students saying, now I know why I had to take math all these years. So that's actually a pretty satisfying uh, response to get from them. I wouldn't say there's been resistance within the math department, but I think um, there's people that have taught linear algebra in a particular way for a fairly long time and have a particular way of thinking about it as more of a theoretical course. And I mean, I guess I guess I would draw an analogy to, you know, to calculus in a way. I mean, I was around back in, in, in the 90s when the calculus reform movement uh, you know, sort of came along. And, uh, you know, people in a first year calculus class used to do epsilon delta proofs. And when when calculus reform came along, they had to rethink that. And there was, you know, a lot of thought like this, you know, this isn't a rigorous course and, you know, you're not really teaching mathematics. And I think we're going through a linear algebra reform phase now in, a, in an analogous way. And so I think, I think in some sense, you know, again, I, I wouldn't say there's resistance, but I think there's retraining that, that needs to happen. And, and I really like Joe's idea of just, you know, putting modules out there a blog post here's how you can here's how you can use this because what i hear from my colleagues is you know when they do this it's like wow we talked about page rank today and it was awesome like 
And it's just it's just something you can drop into a course. The, the students respond extremely positively and it's significant mathematics as well. So it kind of hits that sweet spot and, uh, you know, instructors and students really get on board with it. Dave, um, Timor Jirija, anybody wants to add something? Oh, I can. I was just going to add the same type of ideas that finding the ways that you can integrate it into the curriculum, like it was brought up that the dot product, I mean, if you're teaching the dot product, you can easily bring up the way that, I mean, I point out that if you ask somebody 50 questions, you can potentially find a date. Doesn't mean it'll be a good date, but at least it might be better than a random date or you can actually move it into Netflix and things like that. It depends how much time you have. But for instance, the March Madness thing that I brought up, that's used by people throughout the country and it's used even by middle school teachers. There's a model on there where it gives you the option for linear weighting, which I didn't talk about any of that, but it's a terrible weighting method. So why is it there? Because I wasn't planning for this thing to be national and I'd already taught middle school teachers to do it. And it's a way for them to teach slope which for many of them is an absolutely horrible topic to be teaching, but suddenly you can actually weight um, methods that way. But I will say a high schooler got a 99% bracket using linear weighting, which seems absolutely impossible to me. So that's always been one of the uh, highlighted examples for me. But yeah, finding ways that like David said, that someone who may not wanna go all in, but they can, they can offer that, which can engage a whole bunch of students who may not be into a delta epsilon proof uh, analogy within whatever course they're taking. Thanks, Tim. Jirija, you want to add something? Anything different to add, except possibly a, a different perspective, which is that maybe we can think of the fact that a lot of the math that's required for data science and engineering is actually very, very fundamentally similar and overlapping. And, what we want to teach students isn't necessarily the name of this particular method, but it's that systematic thinking of simplifying something, breaking it down, and then building it back up. And so there actually might be far more synergies here than one might think. It just might require that little bit of change of thinking actually on the instructor's part. So maybe small things can actually go a long way here, possibly, that we're trying to do that in, our, in some of our courses. but. Just a different perspective. Thanks. Thanks. Okay. Well, I guess we got a good answer on that one. Um, and then this one is fun. I love it. So Hamilton Davis is asking us, so you can just answer one thing. What is your favorite data topic application for inclusion in a standard linear algebra class? So you can just answer one, one thing. And so, so let's go as a round and let's everybody mention his favorite applications. Uh, Joe, you want to start? I mean, I don't, I don't do any linear algebra, but for me, it's all about like linear models. So just, you know, Y equals X beta is, is just my go-to, but it's not very exciting. Sorry. No, it's great. It's great <laughs> if you have the to back it up, I think it's perfect. Uh, David. So I, I seriously have to just choose one. <clears throat> so, so. Um, well, I, I mean, like, like Joe said, I think, so we, we do a lot of uh, regression in the class. And I mean, in some sense, it's, it's the bread and butter of, you know, building a machine learning model. Um, but the students, they they really get it. They've been aware of it and they've seen it before. They've probably seen it in another class or they've implemented it on a calculator, but they've never known what's really going on. And so when they have that experience, it's like, oh, this, the, you know, what's going on under the hood is really accessible. And it's it's the linear algebra, that, that kind of thinking uh, that, that leads me to that. That's, that's a pretty powerful experience for them. Um, I really like, I mean, the, the students, when they start to see singular value decompositions and someone on the internet, I'm sorry, I forgot who the, who did this, said this quote, but they said a singular value decomposition is like having x-ray vision into a matrix. And there's, there's some, there's some, you know, truth to that, that when, when students start to pick up on that, it's just like, oh my goodness, this is so powerful. Uh, and, 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 and at the same time, there's, it's kind of simple at the same time. So um, I don't know, it's hard to pick one. Thanks, David. Uh, Tim? 
Oh, I mean, I'm a numerical linear algebra who works in ranking. So mine is page rank and sports ranking, but that's because I know a lot and I have fun with it. <laughs> Thanks, Tim. And yeah, if you have to pick one linear algebra to pick. Um, I would choose a kind of singular value decomposition and the application would be um, brain machine interfaces. It's kind of this idea that oh, you can take a signal from someone's brain and then predict what they're trying to do. And hey, you're a freshman and you can understand the math behind why this works uh, is something that kind of really excites students and excites me. It's a fun lecture to teach, so that's what I pick. Thank you. Um... So if, if, I could, if I could just jump in, that, that thought is so important that this is really accessible to students at a at a relatively early age in our academic academic journey, it's it really um, it, it's it's very motivating even for students that might not you know like I see students that aren't necessarily you know completely sold on math, and they see and they see some of this. It's like now I get it, and that's you know from my perspective, I said at the beginning of my thing like I think of data science for math. That's that's how this really ties in because. The, the, the payoff is just is huge for the students. Thanks, thanks. Um, let's move to uh, the next question. So this question received six votes. It's from Lafan Liu. And the question is, how do you emphasize the less sexy parts of statistics or data science to non-mathematics people? So, I mean, I, I don't think we have to, if somebody wants to speak for that, how do you emphasize the less sexy parts of statistics and data science to non-mass people? Well, one of the things for me is that I'm not really sure totally what that means because all, all steps are needed. And so, I mean, I try to emphasize that everyone has a place. And so part of the reason we have 100 students, which we're only a school of 2,000, so that's a lot of students, it's a lot of students anyway, but the is that if you have, I mean, we need people to record data and I'm not sure that's an exciting thing, but without your accurate data, we have no insight. And so um, part of it is emphasizing the need of each thing, because if they understand, in my opinion, the need, then at least you recognize it's important because if it seems trivial, then I think it becomes less interesting. And I, some of the most tedious tasks are amazingly important to learn to do accurately. Uh, yes, Jirija. I can take this because it's something I've struggled with a lot. And one of the things that I've tried to do is teach the class in modules. So say, OK, we now have x problem to solve. For example, we need to solve page rank. And we need to understand how to do this and then work backwards from the problem to all the things that are needed in the solution and so null spaces for example is something that my students always dislike they're like this is boring why do i care when an equation is equal to zero but somehow eigenvalues and page rank is much more interesting even though if you think about it it's the same concept and so you know that that pipeline and that narrative and that storytelling can often help by instead of saying, let's talk about null spaces, then eigenvalues, then page rank. If you go page rank, backtrack, okay, some prep, then they're willing to bear with you for like half a lecture while you do something boring because you've promised them something exciting at the end. Thank you, Jirija. Um, we good? Uh Move on to the next question, and it's again from uh, Alex Deketiar, and it received three votes. And it's about, it's a good question. It's about, the, he, he framed it as the siloing, the siloing between math, statistic, CS, computer science, and how, uh, actually, maybe the question is where does data science fit, and how does it work at your university, and maybe cooperation between these departments. Um, I, I think it's a, it's a good question. There is a relative question. I'm going to bring it up now. Uh, but Moni McGee is speaking about uh, ABET and accreditation for engineering. And I mean, 
a degree in data science might need to be accredited by Abet at some point. So, I mean, I think it's important to... So, does somebody want to speak about the siloing? I mean, I think it's a little... Okay, but the interaction between math, CS, and statistics, and maybe Abet and engineering and these accreditation things. I'm going to take it because I don't have a very good answer, so I don't want to follow anybody. So um, I, I think you were really smart to combine the questions because I think sort of one of the cruxes of the problem is who at the university is leading the charge, is leading the, the data science charge, right? Is it somebody in engineering or is it somebody in math or is it somebody in CS or is it somebody in statistics, right? And, and, and that's like 95% of what's going on with the curriculum and, and everything else. And so, um, I guess I'm optimistic about things like this and that despite where the programs have started, that we're going to grow and merge and, and learn from each other. So I guess, um, I guess I would say time and, and like the question says, you know, PhDs in data science and, and time will, will allow us to, to get rid of all the silos. I guess I'll try to follow up because uh, you know, I, I think that was actually a really nice answer, Joe. Um, you know, and you know, we've we've certainly seen the same thing here. Um, our data science programs have come out of uh, stats and CS without much consultation with us, and I think you know there's a lot of reasons for that, and you know I'm happy to take some of the blame for it. Uh, but I think what we're seeing is that it it is kind of bringing us together in some sense. Like we've got all these courses. And our students are taking, you know, we have we have students that, you know, their majors and minors are spanning over these different these different courses, and you know, I'm I'm sitting in class and my students are telling me, oh yeah, we did this 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 subject in this other class, and so then we start talking as the instructors about it. So it's it's really kind of backwards, but um, as as Joe said, I think I feel kind of optimistic about the conversations we're having, and and this is something that I think is really good, especially for a math department to, to be more connected to uh, other other um, departments on campus. And this is a great opportunity. David, thanks a lot. Mm -hmm. How to follow after Joe and David? I don't have much to say, but I know I have much less to say than Joe thought she had when she didn't have much to say. But Davidson, uh, our program was built out of various departments. So it was intrinsically shared among departments. And so that's part of the reason I don't have a lot to, to say. But I will say that part of that came from the administration's desire for there to be a program. And they wanted it to be interdisciplinary. Um, I, beyond that, I don't know what else to say, but I, that was that was what created the momentum for that. Okay, doc. And uh, can we do a quick round with the four of you and just repeat, just repeat, summarize very briefly, what is the status of data science at your university? So do you have a BS in data science? I mean, I know you mentioned it in your slide, most of you, but just to repeat, what is the status of data science? Is it a few courses that are called data, machine learning, or... So let's just do a quick round. Uh, Joe, can you answer my question? Um, I'm in conversation about a minor, uh, but we don't have any courses or anything. Okay, that's a perfect answer. Uh, David? Yeah, we currently have a data science minor that's taught in the, in the statistics and computer science departments. And then there's a master's in data science as well, which is also taught in those departments as well. Thank you, Dave. Tim? We have a minor and then our computer science uh, it, uh, department is heavily data science oriented. So is there some plan of doing, are you working on something new or is it kind of like? There's kind of discussion about a major, yeah. Yeah, go, okay. okay. Yeah. And who, who would, who would, own this major? That's the part that's being discussed. <laughs> okay, yes. <There> we go. <laughs> Okey doke. And Dirija? We have a major and a minor in data science. Okey doke. Thanks. Thanks for repeating. And everybody mentioned it quickly, but just to sum up. Um, 
I think I've, I've not asked, so let's let, let's go back. I think I didn't ask the question of Alex Decatier correctly, and I'm going to, uh, he put, he, he, he rephrased this question in the chat, so I'm just going to, to rephrase the question. So it's in the chat. Um, so the question is, should we plan for a workforce, uh, for the workforce that we have now when we teach, when we teach, should we plan for the workforce that we have now, or should we plan for the workforce force that we will have in five, seven years with PhD in data science and a more holistic view. Um, somebody wants to take this one? Well, I guess I'll jump in. I think I think it depends on, on your students. Um, I think I think where I am at my institution, um, I probably am not going to see a huge number of people go on into a PhD program in data science. So I'm, I'm more interested right now in, in training my students and giving them the skills that they can, you know, go into the workplace after they leave here. Um, I hope as I'm doing that, I'm also preparing them to, uh, to continue learning. And so that as, as new, new things come along, they're able to assimilate those and to adapt as well. Thank you, David. So, but to, to another question, another uh, un, um, unrelated topic, uh, it's from Vasilis Zafiris. So thank you, Vasilis, to participate and be with us. Uh, so the question is about uh, programming language. And uh, so are you incorporating Python into your calculus and your in linear algebra courses? I would assume what programming language do you use and how much programming do you put in your, uh, in your classes and how? I think that's the question. take it please um, so uh yes linear algebra introductory sequence for our electrical engineering and computer science majors uh does use a lot of ipython so you use jupyter notebooks most of the students are and we have a co-requisite that they co-enroll in the introductory programming course um but we don't teach them python and the the Python that they have to do in the courses, like entire code is written for them and they have to insert one line or they have to insert one variable. So it's not so much about programming, but it's about using the visualization that they will get from that notebook to understand something. So I wouldn't say that we teach them Python, but we use it a lot. About programming language, I think Dave, you say you were using Sage in your linear algebra class? Uh, yeah, uh, we start out with Sage in the in the first course, and then over the uh, in the second course we make a transition into Colab notebooks, um, and then they kind of follow up with that in subsequent courses. So, so yeah, they are getting a considerable amount of Python experience. And I would also echo, we don't, you know, we're not really teaching them programming, uh, but we're teaching them how to use the computer to explore linear algebra. In, in, in a kind of significant way, I would say. Um, in, in our later courses, we do, you know, there's more of a emphasis on scientific computation, I would say, in Python. Uh, Tim, you're unmuted, I guess you want to speak? Yeah, but the computer science uses Python and then the data science minor uses primarily R. And so that's the two languages and interesting that they break into those pieces and those different tracks. Just to pitch in here, we're also struggling between Python, R, and we have MATLAB. I think we're, uh, yeah, I think, and really hard to, I mean, the statisticians are married to R. Huh? So that's um, in, my, in my department for sure. We are not, I mean, it's R or nothing. They don't want to hear about anything else. So it's, uh, we are, um, we are struggling a little, and I'm not sure why I'm speaking, uh, but uh, we, our students are more and more appreciative that we try to stick to not too many programming language. And so like in summer, we're teaching a bunch of classes and everybody using Python and the students are giving good feedback that we, there is some consistency in the program. So, yeah. uh, Joe, what programming language do you use? I don't teach linear algebra, so um, I I think they use I don't I don't know to be honest. 
they might use a little Python, a little bit of like MATLAB or something just to do some things, but not much. Joe, what do you do in your classes though? Your stat classes and the oh, oh yeah, no, I'm totally married to R. Yeah, no, yeah. all R all the way for all yeah. my classes. That's yes, yes, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> That's why I asked. Sorry, thank you, Tim. <laughs> And so we have time for one more question. And I think some more questions are more focused to people. So I'm going to let this go. We're just going to, to try to do one more clean. Uh, and it's a question from uh, Jirija Ranade, which is here. I didn't realize. So Jirija is asking a question to David. And the question from Jirija to David is, um, how do you introduce variants to your students without, without requiring probability knowledge? Yeah, it's a, it's a good it's a good it's a good question. Um, so you know, a lot of students come into the class as freshmen, having seen this idea in high school. So they've been exposed to a little bit of data in high school, um, and uh, we kind of motivate it through through some examples. So they they've seen things like centroids uh, in the class where they're computing a centroid, and so the idea of a of a second moment um, has you know you can kind of tack onto that and. Um, pretty early in the semester, we um, we look at k-means clustering, and so there, you know, the idea of the variance of a cluster is something you can really see, and so the students are getting an intuitive sense for it. Um, we certainly don't uh, go into a lot of depth in in that subject. I mean, we, we we don't talk about sampling and that that kind of thing. It's more like we're you know here's here's a data set. You know, we want to we want to understand the variance, and we want to know where the variance is greatest because variance is interesting. Thanks a lot, David. I think we're going to try to to finish some time, so I'm just going to to conclude now. I'm reading in the chat the comment from Mark uh, Saula, and he's saying, "What a wonderful session! I plan to watch it again when the recordings come out and recommend to others." And um, I, I want to read that because it's exactly the same for me. I feel completely overwhelmed. I'm not sure. I think I got 10% of, of what everybody has said. And it was really a lot. And I will definitely need, and I want to, to rewatch the session again and, and, and learn more from you. Um, I feel very humbled by our four speaker. I mean, everything that is done across the country in data science and, and the interaction between math and data science. and. I mean, it, it, it's amazing. And so I am humbled by, by your experience, you panelists, but I'm also uh, very hopeful, very hopeful that there is a very bright future with lots of things to do. So I'm very excited about all that. Um, I want to thank the audience. The audience has been amazing, lots of questions, so great questions. So thanks the audience for, for being here and big thanks in, uh, for our four speakers. So Joe, David, Tim, and Jirija, thanks a lot for being with us today. Thank you. Thank you. Yep. And